so so it was the second it was the second week in november when 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 god the holy spirit uh gave me the memory verse for the month of december and that's a rarity he usually gives it to me on the week of and 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 it was romans 15 13 right may the god of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the holy spirit and you know and and i shared on that verse you know unbeknownst to me really uh, un, unplanned and undetected um that first Sunday in December, I preached a message on hope. And um, I didn't even know what God was doing. And then last week, Paul, where's Paul? Is Paul here? Paul. And then last week, Paul, who doesn't preach, that's what he says. Come on, fellas. Right, do you see it by now? Talk to him. Who says he doesn't preach, brought a message led by the Spirit of God on, on peace. And uh, it was early last week that I realized what God was doing. Sometimes he's hard to, to figure out, amen? But that's good because it reminds us who's on the throne. And, and, and so uh, Paul preached on the second advent. Hope is the first advent. The second one is peace. And then so naturally today, uh, I'm going to bring a, a message on the third advent because I finally figured out what God was doing. Um, thank you, Brother Pastor Dave, for bringing that to my attention. <laughs> God is good, right? So... Um, let me begin by asking you a question, right? How many of you can use a dosage of joy this morning? How many of you know that you can use some joy? How many of you know someone who, or some ones, or more than one person who can use some joy during this Christmas season? Perhaps some of us as well, right? And so, so I want to share today on the message of joy. Now, let's not overlook the fact that there is a lot going on in our world that can bring discouragement. Joy is not always easy to find, especially when it's being looked for in the wrong places or when it's being confused with happiness. See, happiness is easier to have than it is to have joy. But one one can be a lie or it, can be a, it, it could be a, a temporary high. The other one cannot. So we're going to talk a little bit about, about joy this morning. Uh, I do want you to know that the Bible, do you know this? That the Bible commands us to be joyful all the time. What in the world does that mean? How can, how can someone be joyful all the time? And I think that, that it's in order to understand that, we need to understand what the verse is saying. The verse is saying, be full of joy is to always have joy, to be full of joy. And one of the problems comes, the challenge comes when we confuse what happiness is with what joy is. So I want to read to you. This is from the Quest Study Bible. Uh, he gives a little insight to kind of, kind of clarify a bit. How can we be joyful when we're really sad? So unlike much contemporary society, the Bible does not confuse joy with happiness. I was looking up some differences between joy and happiness on the internet the other day and and i found a bunch of different reasons why we should be happy and um uh and and, and in many of those they would connect joy with happiness as almost as if they were the same exact things and i decided to leave that alone because they were way off they're way off um so contempt uh, 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 unlike contemporary uh, society, the Bible does not confuse joy with happiness. Happiness is an emotional state typically, typically dependent upon external circumstances. The Bible, the biblical concept of joy involves a deeper reality. Joy includes a condition of genuine well-being marked by confidence, hope, and trust that extends far beyond our own finite perceptions. Happiness is often temporary. Joy is more of a process. Get this. Joy is more of a process often developed most profoundly during periods of chaos and suffering. Think about that. Joy is more of a process that is often developed, strengthened most profoundly during periods of chaos and suffering. The deep sustaining joy of the Lord comes from an assurance that he is with us and that he will deliver us from present difficulties as well as from this scarred and stained world. 
such joy is able to express its hope even in the middle of legitimate sadness. Difference between joy and happiness. Our springboard text for today is up on the screen now. Nehemiah 8 and verse 10 and the third part of it. Simply it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. There's an easy verse to memorize. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And up on the screen now as well would be the title of our message for today. is simply the fullness, fullness of joy. Let's talk to the Lord about that. Would you please stand with me and join me in prayer? Father, we bless you and we praise you this morning uh, for the wonderful songs, uh, the worship of Jesus, and above all, for the presence of Jesus. Holy Spirit, we give you total um, freedom to lead and to guide and direct this service, this message, your word. You're at liberty. You're free to be who you are to say what you want to say and to do what you want to do in our hearts. We commit our hearts to you, not just ours in this, in this sanctuary, but those listening to us online. We praise you for your love for us and your presence here today, and we pray that you would be glorified. Holy Spirit, exalt and lift up Jesus. It's because of him that we gather. We praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So let, let, me, let, me give you a little, let me give you first a little content here, right? So in chapter 7 of the book of ne Nehemiah, um, after being in captivity for some 70 years, the people of God, um, allow, about 50,000 of them are allowed to return back to their homeland. That is after Persia took over as the leading nation over Babylon. And so they allowed these people to get back to their native land, or at least 50,000 of them. More would eventually be sent. And so um, up on the screen now, I want you to notice the content now in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 8 through 10. It says, they, that would be Nehemiah and Ezra and the Levites. Uh, they read from the book of the law, from God's word, making it clear and giving the meaning so that the people understood what was being read. Verse 3 does say that, that this happened from morning to, no, to the end to, to noon, which would be about six hours, all right? At least six hours they stood there. So I, I plan on being about four. So six is, we're going to beat that six thing, okay? We'll, I'll give you four. You guys good for four hours of preaching today? We can take turns. We got Paul sitting in the back. Paul, all right. Um, and then chapter, verse 9 says, Then Nehemiah, the governor, Ezra, the priest, and the teacher of the law, and the Levites, who were instructing the people, said to them all, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people had been weeping as they listened to the words of the law. They were weeping as they heard God's word. Nehemiah said, Go and enjoy choice food and sweet drinks. Boy, you know that would have gotten my attention. Uh, I like Nehemiah. Go and enjoy uh, uh, choice food, sweet drinks, and send some to those who have nothing prepared. This day is holy to our Lord. And then he says, do not grieve, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the, the Greek word for strength here, the Hebrew word for strength here is the word meos. And meos is the same Hebrew word for protection, for shelter, for refuge, for fortress, and for stronghold. So the, the Lord is all of that. He is, he is our fortress. He protects us. He is our refuge. He keeps us. He is our, our shelter. We hide in Him. He's our stronghold. He's where our strength comes from. He is everything we need, and that's where joy comes from. Joy doesn't necessarily come from what's going on in your life. That's happiness. That's happiness. Joy comes from what's going on in your heart because of the God who lives in there. So he says the joy of the Lord is your strength. They were grieved, right? They were, they were grieved. They were saddened. that They were hurt because as the word of God was being read, they realized how much they had sinned against God. 
they realized how much they had failed him so bad that they would be taken captive to Babylon for 70 years. The temple destroyed and the city destroyed. They knew that they had done wrong and so they were grieved. They were crying. They were weeping. But they were, always, they were also reminded that, that, uh, that God is a God of forgiveness and a God of restoration. They were reminded that, that God forgives and he cares and he loves the weeping and the fasting would come on the day of atonement. This wasn't a day of fasting. There was a, this was a day of feasting as they were to recognize and to be reminded of God's faithfulness and his goodness and his promise to restore. Jeremiah the prophet told them many a times, you to surrender and go to Babylon, but God will restore you. Ezekiel picked up right from there. God will restore you. Dan, Daniel, these are all contemporaries, those three prophets, all said the same thing. There's judgment, there's difficulty, there's challenge. But God will restore his people. And so they wanted them to realize this. This is not a time to weep. This is a time to, to, to recognize who God is and to recognize his faithfulness and his goodness uh, to us. So church... Um, the joy of the Lord is what provides the necessary ability or what we need, you and me, to be able to, to deal with the challenges of life, to deal with the difficulties of life and, and the things that go on in life, sometimes to deal with our own shortcomings, the circumstances, the challenges, the shortcomings, not just of our world, but our own personal lives. So God gives us this ability as he lives his life in us and through us of his faithfulness and his graciousness and his constant goodness. So, so he is, yeah, he's a constant refuge amidst our sorrow. And he's a, he's a, he's a place of shelter in the tough times, in troubled times. We can lean on him because he sustains us in difficulties all the time. So if, if we search hard enough in our trials and in our storms, search inside, we'll have something to be joyful about. It says the joy of the Lord is your ability and it's my ability to keep going. The joy of who he is, the joy of what he's done, the joy of his promises. And so he's faithful to his word. And guess this, it's available to all people. The joy of the Lord is available to all people. Why? Why is it available to all people? As we think about Jesus, I want you to listen to these verses I'm going to read to you, right? Um, they're not on the screen. So I want you to notice the common denominator in these verses. Ready? Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. This is so very important. Uh, Hebrews 1 and verse 9. It says, You have loved righteousness and you have hated wickedness. Therefore, God, capital G, your God, capital G, God, capital G, your God, has set you above the companions or your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. By the way, the content in this verse is Jesus. So in other words, Jesus is declared to have been anointed with the oil of joy. And then in Luke 2.10, get this, when the angel announced the birth of Jesus, the shepherds in the field his first, to, uh, uh, to, the, the, to the, shepherds in the, the shepherds of the field, his first words were this. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. This is when Jesus is coming into the scene. He's been anointed with oil. When he comes into the scene, he offers great joy for all the people. Now Jesus is speaking in John 15, 11. It says, these things I have spoken to you so that, get this please, that you may, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be made full. This is Jesus speaking. And then in John 16, 24, he says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, hear this, and your joy will be complete. And then in John 17, 13, he says, I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world so that you may have the full measure of my joy within you. That's Jesus. The joy of the Lord is 
your strength. Jesus has been anointed with the oil of joy. He's been prophesied to bring joy, and he himself declared that he would bring joy. Let's not forget Hebrews 12, 2, right? Hebrews 12, 2, where, where it says, Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's the author and the perfecter of our faith, who by the joy set before him endured the cross. You know, I've thought about this verse. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. That means that Jesus had, had really no reason at the moment to experience joy. Even in Gethsemane, it says he wept before God and said, take this cup away from me. But because of the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. Jesus knew that even in trial and suffering, God has a purpose. And it's always a good purpose when we're dealing with God. And of course, in John 10.10, 10, the enemy comes to steal and kill and destroy. But Jesus says, I have come to give you joy. To give you abundant life. Abundant life. Well, what is abundant life? Is a life filled with the purposes and the joy of the Lord. Is a life filled where you know he's in charge and he's in control. That's a life of fulfillment. I want to fill your life. That, the enemy comes to bring this, but I've come to bring joy to bring fulfillment the joy of the lord is your strength and so in, in in nehemiah 8 and verse 10 we have this dynamic challenge and then jesus jesus picks it up from there Jesus himself has become the embodiment of joy, the benefactor of joy. In other words, when Jesus came into the world, we know, we think about it, he came to go to the cross. We know that he came to suffer. We know that he came to carry your sin and my sin upon his body. We know that he came to be, he was separated from God during those three days. We know all that there was a lot of suffering there. But when Jesus came to planet earth, he came as a package of joy. He came to provide that what we needed to have joy, to provide fulfillment and purpose in life. He came to fix what was broken. And when you fix something that's broken, that's where joy comes from. And Jesus' joy came from what he came to do. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, what does that mean for us? With regard to Jesus, if the joy of the Lord is our strength, what does it mean to the church? What does it mean to those who are not yet in the church? What does it mean for a world where there is no joy, where there is where there's plenty of happiness, right? We did this temporary thing. I was happy. I was all night in the bar drinking and partying. Now I have a hangover. The joy is gone, but I had some happy, the happiness is gone, but I had some for a little while. No, Jesus came to bring joy. So what does the joy of the Lord have to do with you and me with regard to Jesus? There's so many more, but I want to give you four that stand out to me a lot today. There's so many more uh, when we think about joy. So many more reasons, scripturally speaking, uh, as to why we can experience joy on a daily basis, moment by moment in our lives. Yes, in spite of the storms. So I want to give you four of them this morning here. I want you to notice, um, first of all, that there's joy up on the screen. There is joy in knowing and claiming his word. <laughs> there is joy in knowing and claiming his word and his promises. Notice Jeremiah 15 verse 16 up on the screen. This is Jeremiah the prophet speaking. He says, when your words came, I ate them. That is, I internalized your word. I memorized your word. I meditated on your word. I held on to your word. I leaned on your word. When your words came, I ate them. They were the joy and the delight of my heart. Jeremiah the prophet says, there's something about God's word. You've heard it preached before, and you'll probably hear it preached as long as I'm here as a pastor. We cannot experience the blessings of God without his word. His word brings joy. And, the, and, and, and Jeremiah, the promise that there were the joy of my heart. Psalm 119, 105 says the word that, that God's word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Psalm 119, 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart so that I would not sin against you. The word of God keeps us even from falling into sin as we're meditating on his word. And so there's joy in knowing that we have God's word on our side. That helps us. 
There's a story about a Christian woman. She just came to Christ, and she was reading her Bible, and one day someone said to her, let me know, let me, th tell me, um, is God's Bible blessing you as you're reading his Bible? Is it blessing you? Um, are you reading the Bible? And she said, well, let me tell you the truth. The Bible is reading me. The Bible, God's word has, it's like, it's, it's, it's almost like, it's almost like when you look in the mirror, the Bible tells you who you really are. It tells you what you have. It tells us, it's his love letter. It's his reminder that he loves us in spite of us and that he loves us in spite of what we've done. What makes God's word powerful is this, it's, is that he means what he says. And he means what he says about himself and he means what he says about about you and so if God's word says I love you in spite of you that means that he loves you in spite of you we can come up with hundreds of reasons why God should not love us I don't know about you but I can come up with hundreds of reasons why God should disown me and why God should d separate himself from me but no matter what his word tells me that that he doesn't love me or he doesn't love us because we're lovable. He loves us because he is love. It's who he is. And so his word reminds us it's powerful because of that. So the sword of the spirit, right? Two months ago, I can't believe two months went by since we spoke about the armor of God. Don't let that slip from you. Remember to pray that little prayer there. Um, but we spoke about the sword of the spirit. That's the word of God. That's the only, right, we spoke about it being the only offensive weapon of the six pieces of the armor. And so if it's the only offensive weapon, that means that we need to know how to use it and how to use it right. We need to know how to use this one weapon, the Word of God, but we can't use it right unless we're in it. It's, it's what gives you joy is knowing, knowing His Word, reading His Word, memorizing His Word, claiming his word holding on to his word in the storms and the battles holding on and claiming his word that's that's joy knowing that that we have his word and that we have his word uh, on our side and so as you read his word remember remember that this is his word it tells you who god is it tells you what god does it tells you who the holy spirit is it tells you where he's at where is he right now it, it tells you where he's at and it tells you what he came to do. But don't forget that it also tells you who you are, whose you are, and why you are. That's where joy comes from. I may not be feeling well. I may not be feeling happy. I might, may not be feeling saved. I may not be feeling loved. I may not be feeling it today, but the book tells me that I have it. That's where joy comes from. It's a matter of mindset and perspective where we focus on in difficulties. I like Job, Job 23, 12, not on the screen. It says, I have not departed from the commands of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. Isn't that a powerful verse? Isn't that a love for God's word? How could we love the word that much? It is more important than the foods we eat. How? By experiencing the joy of what that word is saying in response to Jesus, who he is, and God, as well as ourselves, as his followers and his children. I've treasured the words of his mouth more than my daily bread. There is joy in knowing and claiming his word. Secondly, up on the screen, there is joy in knowing you're never alone. He's always with you. There's joy in knowing that you're never alone, my friends. Hebrews 13, 5, the second part, it says, Be content with what you have, because God has said, Never will I leave you, never will I forget you. Be content with what you have, because as long as you have God, you have everything you need. You can have everything in this world, but if God is missing, you've lost. God provides what we need. What we need does not provide God. If anything, it separates us from God. What we want, oftentimes, often, it's what we need is Christ. 
And so be content with what you have. Paul says, I've learned the secret of being content, whether well-fed or hungry. I can do all things through Christ. Be content with what you have. So this verse, Hebrews 13, 5, is actually from uh, Deuteronomy 31, as well as Joshua chapter 1. And it's taken from there. And so what he's doing is he concludes by giving an exhortation regarding basically God's promise to not withhold his presence or, or nor his help and his protection. That's the promise he's given us here because he's always with us. Remember when Moses was to go out to war, he'd say to God in the 30s of the book of Exodus, he says, let us not go unless your presence goes with us. It's knowing that he's always there with us. I wanted to read to you something. This is one of my favorite books. It's only got 95 pages. You can read it in one say. Brother Lawrence lived in the 18th century. We can sit and chat about him for a long, long time. But his book, Practice of the Presence of God, and boy, did he practice it. He wasn't a theologian. He didn't know Hebrew, and he didn't know Greek, but he was a man of God. And he was filled with this intensified desire to walk in his presence day by day. So I read, read a couple of things for him. He says, the practice of the presence of God obtains the grace we need to deal with temptation and to conduct ourselves in this world. Think about that. The pra imagine practicing his presence, that is being in tune with the presence of the Lord, a consciousness of his presence at a moment of temptation. What do you think is going to happen? If you're in tune with his presence, you know he's there. You know he's at your side. You, you're fellowshipping with him and he with you. You're sensing his presence at a moment of temptation. That's the way to conquer temptation is to be conscious of his presence at a moment of weakness. What do I do right now? He's right at your side. He's going to help you with that. He says, he says, our hope increases as our faith penetrates God's secrets through practice of our holy exercise. That was his exercise, practicing the presence of God. He says, the soul thus inflamed can no longer live except in the presence of his God. When you find God, when you encounter God like that, when you have that encounter with the divine presence of God himself, it's something you don't want to let go of. And you know, sisters and brothers, that if you've ever experienced God like that, you want to experience him like that all the time. But we live in a world and in circumstances that are, that are designed to keep us from that. Because Paul says we don't live by sight we live by faith but often we we live by sight instead and when we start living by sight we lose sight of god because it takes faith and mindset to see god i thank god i was able to go on vacation last wednesday i was in my home listen wherever i'm at i just want to read and study if you don't know that by now um talk with me about it so we go on vacation and my wife and i have fa fights and the domestic abuse that that close to happening because i'm bringing my laptop and i'm bringing my books and my study guides uh but wednesday i was home uh, throughout the week i'm home and i'm just not i wasn't restful I, I, and I wasn't restful i don't mean that i wasn't getting good sleep or i wasn't and instead of this, um feeling happy or at ease is that i wasn't in my spirit, I wasn't restful. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't sensing. I wasn't feeling well in my spirit. And so my wife and I decided, hey, let's just go to a hotel somewhere nearby and get away for a little while, for a couple of days. And I thought it was a waste of time because I'm going to do there what I was going to do here, read, study, and things like that. So I did take my things with me, but I had two wonderful, I was there four days, and I was telling Anne Glotfeld, I had two wonderful days when, when, um, uh, just the Lord met me in a special way. Sometimes we just need to get along with God. And sometimes we just, you know, it's the normal everyday thing, you know, have my devotion, read my Bible, good job, did that, another day out the way. Uh, but sometimes God wants to meet you in a different way. Sometimes God wants to show up in a way that he hasn't. And it's okay to pray, God, and I know we don't pray this much because we don't always have the time, but God, I want to see you in a different way this morning. Lord, talk to my heart. So help me to hear what you're saying. Help me to grab it. 
And it's okay to pray that prayer because God is not about ritualism. It's not about do what you always do. Read your word and, and you're doing fine. No, it's, it's, it's about seek me. Seek my face. Listen to me. Receive of me. Let me talk to you. Let me hold you. Let me grab you. Let's get together. And so sometimes he meets you in a special way. And twice I fell on my knees and just wept before the Lord. I didn't plan that. I planned to just read and go about my business. Um, but when he meets you in a special way like that, it's awesome. And that's what I'm talking about, the presence of the Lord. He says here, he says here, um, always in regard to the presence of the God, always in the ceaseless exercise of God's divine presence. And this I've never, ever forgotten. This impacted me so much when I read this book. He says here, his presence, Brother Lawrence says, God's presence has become as easy and natural to me now as it was, as it once was difficult to attain it. Can you even think about what he is saying there? He's saying he is so conscious of the presence of God that is, is, is as difficult of losing that as it was to find God to begin with. That's some deep, deep stuff there. I was sitting home one day. We had left um, Lancaster. We had came, my wife and I, Jeremiah was at work. Uh, we spent some time with Jeremiah and Shally. And um, my fiance, wow, it feels weird saying that, right? She, she's his fiance, right? It's my fiance, you're my fiance, right? We're marrying every day. You're my wife, so we, we could say we're my fiance. All right, anyway, um, so she's his fiance, so I'm, you know, praise God for that's a good thing. But she calls me one day and she's crying. She's she's weeping on the phone and um, uh, her car stored. Uh, it wouldn't start. She didn't know what to do with her car. And and I wasn't there. She didn't know that we had left Lancaster, so I wasn't there. And and Jeremiah was working, and so she's in the middle of. It was like seven six o'clock. It was already getting. It was already dark. And and so I said to her, Shally, Shally. Where's Jesus? Uh, where's Jesus right now, Shally? I know Jeremiah's not there. And I know we're not there. But where is Jesus? And she, it's almost as we forget sometimes, right? When trials come, right? When the storms come. When, yeah, God forbid, a car accident or the doctor gives you bad news or you're having a terrible day and nothing when you, you, you got fired or whatever it might happen or you're not well. Or, uh, where is Jesus during that time? Jesus is not with us dependent on how we feel. He's with us all the time. And so I had to remind the Shally, Jesus is there with you. He knows your situation. He knows what you're going through. He'll help you through. He'll guide you through this time. He'll give you wisdom. Just recognize that you're not alone. How many times the enemy wants us to feel we're alone? And how many times we feel like we're alone? When we're really not alone, if you know Jesus. He's always with us. Promise to never leave us. And though you may not feel him, just know he's there. Claim it. Claim his presence. He's promised to be there. Don't doubt Jesus. That's where we suffer most. And that's why we don't experience the joy of the Lord in conflict and in trial. The joy wasn't in that my car doesn't start. The joy was that I'm not alone and Jesus will get me through this. That's how we work with that. It's all about mindset and perspective. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Notice thirdly, there's joy in knowing you've got victory. Hallelujah, right? There's joy in knowing you've got victory. You can overcome. Up on the screen, 1 Corinthians 15, 57, it says, But thanks be to God, He gives us victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Thanks be to God. He gives us victory through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I just want you to know that Paul in the early church won the lots of persecution. Nero was out to kill him, and he eventually does. 
Uh, there was persecution on every angle. Paul says, thanks be to God, he gives us victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. In James 4, 7, we're reminded the reality of the devil. We're reminded that the devil is real, that he's alive. We're reminded of that, but we're also reminded that we can resist the devil. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's what the Bible says, that if we resist him, that is, if we come against him, that is, if, if we uphold the word of God, that is, if we claim God's promises, that is, if, if even though we're hearing in our ears that we're not God's children, or we're hearing in our ears that we're sinners, or that we're no good, or that we're hopeless, or that God doesn't love us, or that he's disappointed us, even though we're hearing that, we can resist the devil by claiming God's word. Claiming who he is, claiming who we are. Luke 10, 19, Jesus says, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the devil. How much of the power of the devil can you overcome this morning? All the power. All the power. Of course, a lot of it depends where we're at with God, being in the right place with God, doing the little things we need to do, spiritual aerobics. But nonetheless, we have been given this authority that the devil cannot match. Jesus says in the Bible that he has all authority in heaven and on earth. So how much authority does, does the devil have? If, if Jesus has all the authority, how much authority does the devil have? And why do we not believe that? Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, he says, we're not unaware of his tactics, but I think that sometimes we are, we are too aware. We, 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 we are aware of the enemy's tactics. It says we're not unaware of his tactics. Church, encourage, encouraging us to know who the devil is and who he, what he does, but do not for one moment give in to him when he tells you that he can conquer you or that he can overcome you because he can't. That's what the Bible says. He can't. He doesn't have that authority over the people of God. And so there's joy in knowing that you and I have the victory. I think that what I meant is I think that sometimes we are unaware of the devil's tactics. We need to be on God. We need to be on the alert to who he is. But our eyes are on Jesus because our joy comes from him. Uh, we, 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 we don't have the power of Jesus. But Jesus has the power to overtake all of the attacks of the devil. And so he gives you and me the victory. Hallelujah. Amen. Is that a praise report? Is that something to glorify God about? That he gives you and me the victory to overtake every trap and every lie of the devil. We have power over his lies, over his dominion, over his authority that he claims to have, over his plans and his schemes and his deceptions. We have power given by Jesus to overcome all of that. That's a praise report. That's something to say praise God about. That's, that's something to rejoice in the Lord all about. That you and I have this ability to overtake something that we can't see with the naked eye. Because Jesus can. And he gives us that victory. Amen. You've heard it before, right? I heard an old, old story about a Savior come from glory. How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. What does it say next? Victory in Jesus. Can you sing that from your heart? He loved me and he sought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory with his cleansing. Isn't that awesome? We, we, we have joy in knowing that we have victory. Not joy in knowing that victory is coming. Not joy in hoping that we have it, but we have victory in knowing that we have the victory. 
There's joy in knowing that, church. And lastly, notice, there's joy in knowing that you're saved. There's joy in knowing that you're a child of God. Acts 4.12. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. Uh, Lord, that's the wrong verse. It's Acts 4.12. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we might be saved. Know that you're saved. There's joy in knowing that. Salvation is found in no one else, for there's no other name under heaven given to men, women, or children by which we might be saved. You know why the Bible was written? 1 John 5, 13. These things are written so that you may know that you have eternal life. A reminder, the most important reminder in the scriptures uh, that there is hope in Jesus that we can know where we're going to go when that time comes. That's why the word is written. It's, it's written to remind us that it doesn't end here, but it continues beyond here. There is life eternal through Jesus Christ, and even Mary needed a Savior. You know that? The mother of Jesus she herself needed a savior. She declares that in Luke 147. She's praying to God, her savior. So church, the whole doctrine of the immacul immaculate conception is a lie. Mary was not perfect. She was a godly woman who brought the son of God into the world, but she needed a savior. Jesus is the only way to glory. He's the only hope to eternal life. And so the scriptures remind us we have reason to be a joy in knowing that we're saved because there's no other name under heaven given to men, women, and children by which we might be, be saved. And the age doesn't always matter as long as that little boy and that little girl knows that there's a Savior and his name is Jesus. That's happened with Alan, right? Amen. It's never the age. It's what God is doing in the heart of little people as well as the adults. So John 1, 12 says, Yet to all who receive them, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Are you a child of God this morning? Online, are you a child of God this morning? Can you claim his word? Can you claim his promises? Because if you're a child of God, you have something to rejoice about. Even in the storm and the challenge and the trial, you have something to rejoice about. That regardless of what you've done, regardless of where you're at right now, regardless of what you did yesterday, regardless of your past, regardless of what the enemy throws in our ears, the accuser, the brethren, regardless of all that, you have something to rejoice about. When Jesus went to Calvary, he covered every sin in your life, past, present, and future that's something to rejoice about i know who i am paul said i know whom i have believed and i'm convinced that he is able to guard what i've entrusted to him for that day it's knowing who we are and that's where joy comes from it's inside sometimes that's why i say it's harder to find it than happiness happiness comes and goes very fast but joy comes to stay but sometimes we have to just we have to regroup our thought life and search inside and find the many reasons why we can be joyful and happy. That's why Paul could say, be joyful always. And, and, and that's why he could say, listen to this verse. This is powerful. 2 Corinthians 7, 4, not on the screen. It says, I am greatly, this is Paul. I am greatly encouraged in all our troubles. Please hear this. My joy knows no bounds. Isn't that powerful? Paul is in trouble at this time. By the way, you read through 2 Corinthians. He's in trouble. He's, he's, he's soon to be put to death. Okay? He's soon to, 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 his life is soon to end. Nero is right at his tail. He says, my joy knows no bounds. I think that Paul, what he did was he, he, began, he, he, what he did was he changed his thinking process. And instead of thinking of what was going on, instead of thinking of his going to die, instead of thinking of Nero, he began to think, search inside, and remind himself of the things he has in Jesus. My joy knows no bounds. That's a powerful, powerful thought. I want to, um, so yesterday we went to a funeral. 
and um, and I sat there, and I picked up this book that says "Putting My House in Order: Prearrange the Rest Arrangement and Record of Personal Affairs." And I was reading through the records, vital records, why we need to prearrange, prearranging financing, selecting a cemetery plot, purchasing a monument or memorial. How about the will? You know, our wills, things that we need to do, personal affairs, bank accounts, um, all kind of things here. There's retirement plan benefits. There's property owned, safe deposit box, automobile registrations, uh, my will, the living will, the birth certificate, the marriage certificate, the funeral home to be contacted, all these wonderful things, right, that are necessary. Funeral service to be held by church, synagogue. That's the first time I saw church here, by the way. Funeral arrangements, clergyman or a lay person, name, address, phone number, music to be picked, all these wonderful things that are extremely necessary. Military service, you know, records of that. So this is a very, very good book. Place of employment, position held, how long you were there, retirement date, all this stuff. Medal of Honor, yeah, family records, children, grandchildren, everything down. But I kept searching, and when I got all the way to the back, um, I didn't see it. And I searched to make sure, but I didn't see it. I didn't see something that said, date of your assurance of heaven. I didn't see something, anything that said, uh, your spiritual birth certificate. There's nothing in here whatsoever because to the average person that's lost from Jesus, uh, that is not important. But of all the things listed in this book, the most important thing is your spiritual birth certificate. The most important thing is, is your whereabouts. Where is this person at right now? Where are you going to? Are you ready for that? You see, if you're born just once, you die twice. But if you're born twice, you die once. There's life eternal in Christ Jesus. They had it all good. And I searched and searched. Where is your whereabouts? Are you short of heaven? What about your birth, spiritual birth certificate? I want to close by reading. Um, this is called full coverage. Full coverage. I have an insurance policy written in the blood of the Lamb, sealed by the cross of Jesus, redeemable, wherever I am. The company will never go bankrupt. It is bounded by God's promise true. It will keep every word of its contract exactly what it says it will do. I don't have to die to collect it. No premiums do I have to pay. All I do is to keep God's promise and walk in his holy way. No collector will ever come calling it was paid on Calvary's tree. It ensures me for living and dying and for all eternity. Yeah. Church, if we don't understand who he is, we can't have what he offers. If we don't understand who he is, we can't have what he offers. We'll want what he offers, but we'll search for it somewhere else. There's no other name under heaven given to people, men, women, and children, by which we might be saved. As on this, up on the screen as we close, fullness of joy. There is joy in knowing and claiming his word. There is joy in knowing you're never alone. There is joy in knowing you've got victory. And there is joy in knowing that you are saved. Praise God for his word and for his promise. Join me in prayer. Father, in the name of Jesus, we praise you and we thank you for what, is, what has been done. We thank you and praise you for hope in Jesus. If you're seated in this building today, if you're hearing us online, I need to ask you this question. Do you know 
without a shadow of a mind, a shadow of a doubt, that if you die today, do you know for sure that you'll be in heaven? Do you know for sure? As I sat there at the, at the funeral yesterday, I saw all the people, and it was packed, walking in and out, standing, talking, laughing, remembering, crying. Everything was there. And I remember asking the question, if any one of these people suddenly died of a heart attack because it can happen, where would they go? Do they know what's most important? Do you know what's most important as we think about the reality of death? If you're here today and you hope you'll be in heaven and you think you'll be in heaven or you're not sure if you'll be in heaven, I want you to know that that you can leave this place knowing for sure that you'll be in heaven. Not by what you might think will get you there, but by the only way to get there. If you're here today and you're not sure and you want to make sure, I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hand. If you're here today and you're, you're not 100% sure and you want to make sure that you're sure, these things are written so that you may know. Would you see me before you leave? Let's make sure you know for sure that heaven is available for you and that it will be your home. Father, thank you again for your grace and love. Thank you for your word and your reminder, dear Jesus. What a wonderful time of the year to think about uh, the reality of the Christ who came as a babe but became a man and went to that cross to set captives free. Thank you for your hope. Thank you for your word. It brings hope. It brings joy. It brings rejoicing. Thank you for your presence. I don't want to be anywhere without you, Jesus. Thank you for your faithfulness, your goodness, your mercies, everything you've promised us in your word. Thank you for eternal life in Christ. Thank you for everything that you mean. I commit our lives to you, not just ours, but those online as well, Father. We praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our worship team.